All right. So you joined the XFL eight months ago. What's it been like since? I cannot believe that it's been eight months. There's been so much happening and it's just been so fun. It's been really fun from the first moment I had when I sat down with Jeffrey Pollack in my first interview, there was just an incredible energy and an alignment on vision for what we wanted to do, where I was like, I want to learn more, but I want to work with you. And we both believed in what the brand for the Wildcats, we didn't have the name at the time, but what the brand of the XFL and the LA team was going to stand for, that it was just super exciting to just take this journey. Um, when I reflect back and it's really been an incredible ride because it's a unique moment in time where we're starting a team and a league simultaneously. And it's a startup within a startup. <laughs> <laughs> startup within a startup. Different than the LAFC experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've just, I've really enjoyed every minute of it. And you touched on the LAFC experience there, but obviously going from what is now a pretty stalwart brand in LA to an upstart brand with the Wildcats and what you guys have coming, what was that like decision process like? Was it just like something you wrangled with for a while or is it, no, nah, I'm going to go all in and, and this is going to be great? I couldn't have been more fortunate to have had the opportunity to be at LAFC. What a ride. Um, I was there when we put shovels in the ground at the stadium and got to see it all the way through. And it, it was amazing to build that team and build Bank of California Stadium and work with an incredible group of staff, management, and owners. Uh, but we got to a point where we built a machine. And that machine operates itself and needs to get refined and tweaked over time. Uh, but ultimately, the machine is built. And I crave entrepreneurial projects, one of the reasons I went to LAFC in the first place. Yeah. So I wasn't looking to go anywhere, but I got a call about this opportunity. And at first, I heard XFL, and I wasn't sure what that meant yeah. and what it was going to be this time around. But again, Jeffrey and I just were fully aligned, and I really wanted to work with him. And when I learned more about what the vision for XFL 2.0 was and presented what I wanted to do in Los Angeles, it was a perfect fit. And most of the success, even you said you wanted to work with him, most of the success of these entrepreneurial ventures, new leagues, whatever, it comes down to the people. How important was that factor, not only going into it, but also going forward now? You guys are building an entire staff too, which is another thing that people probably aren't even, not only are you building a team and drafting a team, you're building a staff, hiring a staff. So startup within a startup within a startup, really. Oh, yeah, it's all that back of house stuff yeah. that no one thinks about, yeah. right? HR, finance, all the, you know, those dynamics, yeah. office space. Um, but for me, I've had a point in my career where working with good people is more important than anything else. Because especially in a startup entrepreneurial environment, it's hard. And you're going to hit bumps in the road and you're going to have challenges and you're not always going to agree with the people that are around you. But if you can't work through those challenges together and have a rational conversation where you may not end out on the same side of the issue, but at least you guys can appreciate each other's position, it's not worth it to me anymore. Um, you got it. You got to surround yourself with good people. And I would say that to younger people in the business as well, any industry is, you know, you may not have as much opportunity and flexibility to pick the role and the people that you work with, but you should be in roles where you're going to have the opportunity to be mentored and have somebody who's wanting to make sure that your career is being cultivated. And you talked about the vision. So let's go back to that, right? The vision for what the XFL is in LA. We were talking beforehand. There's a lot of teams here. There's a lot of noise from a sports team standpoint. We've seen the ups and downs with the current NFL teams here. How's the XFL going to differentiate besides being a spring football league when there's no other football league playing? Sure. I, I mean, LA, it's obvious. It's cluttered. I'm competing with numerous football teams, numerous sports franchises, but more importantly, the sun. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> Miami. You know what I mean? I'm it's competing. like the factor of the size of the factor. The, the beach. The sun, the surf, you know, the movies. Yeah. All the of mountains. that. It, there's too much to do here, right? Which is why we all love living here. Yeah. Um, but that's the challenge of it. And what was so exciting to me about this opportunity is it's there's 40 million avid football fans out there that want more football. That's it. Yeah. 40 million. That's a massive, massive number. And there's such a desire and demand for more football that this is an incredible opportunity to, sa to satiate that. So if we can bring, we're bringing spring football to those fans the weekend after Super Bowl. So there's no more withdrawal after Super Bowl weekend. You can roll right into the XFL for a 10 week season um, and two weeks of the playoffs. And it was really important for me that that was going to be an experience that was something that we could share with the full Los Angeles market. 
I wanted to make sure that we were going to provide unprecedented access and affordability so that everyone in this market could enjoy a game day. And that's what we're doing. So um, those are huge tenets of what we stand for. When I think about the fan engagement side of the XFL and the LA Wildcats, there's, there's three components. Fans first, access, and affordability. So we are building this with our fans. We're finding them. We want their voices to be heard and collaborate on building a great brand and team for the next 100 years. Um, then provide access behind the scenes, get you closer to the action than ever before. And a component of that is affordability. Um, we announced our ticket prices last week. Yeah. It's huge because we're not just talking the talk, we're walking the walk. Uh, over 50% of Dignity Health Sports Park, where we'll be playing, is going to be $30 or less a game. And what's the response been like so Inc far? I mean, people are shocked. I mean, yeah. we've been saying affordability, 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 but now that they're actually seeing it on paper and can make the transaction and buy those seats, not not in the nosebleeds. This And then there are no nosebleeds really at Dignity yeah, Health yeah, Sports yeah. Park. Every seat's a good seat for football. Um, but you can sit down in the first row for $20. And that really is a message to this whole market that we're here for every community in Los Angeles. And whether you're a Rams fan, a Chargers fan, a Bruin, a Trojan, you should all be Wildcats fans. And do you think that's a model that could be replicated by other sports teams, not just the XFL and the Wildcats, right? Because that's probably one of the biggest issues nowadays. You go to a game like I, you know, I did this week. You know, was, went to the Kings game and nothing against them, but it's thirty dollars to park. It's thirteen dollars to eat a hot dog. It's you know the ticket prices. At some point, do you feel like it's just going to have to come back down to this mean of like we have to provide some type of affordability if we want fans to actually come there? And it's not that people aren't interested in the sports; it's that we've priced them out of the sports. Yeah, I think I think it definitely can be replicated. But it's different. I mean, yeah. we're, we're, our player salaries are not $100 million, right? So it's just a different product. And that's okay, right? And that's great. I think there is room in this marketplace to have both. And when you're pitching the different product to the fans, to the partners, what does that pitch look like? It's really, it, it's, it's interesting because this was something that I'm not sure I thought about right out of the gates. Um, I thought about the fans when I started this. And I think a lot of that came from LAFC and the grassroots effort that we built there. But quickly, I realized that it's not just about the fans building this with us. It's our partners building this with us. So where other leagues have preconceived norms, structure, rules, and regulations, we don't have those yet. So we can go to a partner and truly say, what do you want to get out of this? How can you um, make your sports partnerships and community partnerships more meaningful to your business? Because we have a blank sheet of paper and let's co-create. And what does that co-create on your side look like? What, are you taking risks from a digital standpoint? How are you kind of like, again, it's a busy market. What's the, what's the pitch to these partners besides the affordability in terms of like, okay, you have the chance to, we're going to build a whole campaign. We're going to hold a, build a whole building this is theoretically right around what it is that you guys are going to invest in. Yeah. And, and we're still definitely at the early stages yeah. of it, but here are some examples. So I think I try to push the, I have a high risk tolerance here when it comes to like, let's test things. It's LA, yeah, right? We, yeah. We've got to be different and think outside the box. So one of the things we started early on were these fan meet and greets. The idea of being like, we don't know who our fans are. We got to go out and find them. So we picked different bars and different sub markets of Los Angeles, put it out on social and say, come have a beer with me or general manager and our coach, Winston Moss, Norm Chow, our offensive coordinator, literally sit down around a table and tell us what you want out of this team. That is incredibly refreshing. Yeah. And the feedback has been, no one else does this. I've never been able to have a beer with the president of a sports team before. And I can't believe that you guys are incorporating the fans into the process. It's really meaningful. And that builds a generational long fan. So when I translate that to partners, it's an opportunity for them to be a part of that platform where they're making the consumer feel like they have a voice in what's coming out of it. And I, you know, I think we should have our partners and our fans work together to help co-create this experience. And it's not just slapping a label of a partner onto a fan event. It's let's get them in the same room and let's think about what works for everybody. And once you get them in the same room, I think you mentioned already coming back to LAFC and what you learned there. And just like, I would say a totality of your career too, like, what was that like leading up to now making sure that you took everything from all your stops to now running, you know, an organization from top to bottom, essentially? Sure. It's um, I've been very lucky, very lucky to have a unique set of experiences in sports. And I definitely didn't 
follow the rule book and the normal course. I mean, I started in law school. Yeah. Um, and I was a labor and employment litigator. I think this is a little bit more fun than that. I'm no offense to labor and employer <laughs> litigators, but I feel like running a, running a football team might be a little bit more fun. It's so much fun. I'm having such a good time. And I, you know, in full disclosure, I didn't start out wanting to be a lawyer. Yeah. I was using it as a means to an end to break into this business, but it definitely gave me the skill set and the opportunity to climb the ladder much faster than if I hadn't taken that route. And now going into deal making that I've done through several stops in my career, that legal background has been so valuable, so, so valuable. Um, and it even even at, with the XFL, we didn't have a lawyer at the, in our league office that was focused solely on the XFL at the outset. So sounds like a sounds like a startup. You were the president, the lawyer, the uh, the t shirt roller, the the person outside, and like flagging down fans. <laughs> you got to do it all. You yeah. got to do it all. I was hanging signs yesterday at the draft, and that's what it means to start a new business. It's all hands on deck. And and starting a new business also comes with building a culture, right? You're not only building a culture on the field, but you're building a culture inside the boardroom with the team that you're building. For something like that, like and seeing what has already happened with these other types of startup leagues, what's so important? Like, what are you trying to hone in on from like a culture building standpoint? That's like, okay, this is who we are. This is what we're going to be. So it translates from employee to player, like much so I did at LAFC, where you had tons of success there. Yeah, and and you know, this is the first time I'm doing this. Yeah. So I'm not sure I have all the answers, but I went in with a vision. Um, I wanted to go into this really focusing on community. And that is the brand of the Wildcats. We're building this with our fans. We want to make sure that the underserved communities of Los Angeles are being able to have the opportunity to be incorporated into a professional football team. But that same sentiment applies to the staff. So everyone that comes on board is a brand ambassador for the Wildcats. They have to believe in that mission. If they don't, it's inauthentic, doesn't fit with our brand. I will be as open with our fans and partners as I can be. And if I can't provide that information, I'm gonna tell you, but I'm not gonna give a false pretense around who we are or what we're doing. So everyone on our staff is fully aligned on the message and the vision of what we're doing. They have to serve as brand ambassadors. It's a commitment you make when you join our team. You're a brand ambassador, whether it's working hours or not. I'm not sure there are working hours or not in sports (laughs) anymore. Um, But I think you get the idea is that if if you don't believe it, it's going to it's going to come through. I mean, our ticket sellers, for example, they're they're hitting the phones all day selling tickets. And that's a hard job. And it's a grind. Right. And it's a different component of the sports business. But every single person we've hired in that space, and it's a testament to Elevate, who's our partner on the ticketing side, who's been phenomenal, is they understand that in this market, those folks, they're they're having that one on one connection every day. And we went through a really thorough process to make sure that everybody was fully on board with what we were going to be doing and were able to convey that message authentically. And authentically, obviously, is going to help from a grassroots movement, which you hope spurns, you know, long term success. But it's hard not to ignore the elephant in the room was that there was another spring football league recently came up, ended in a firestorm. Obviously, it's not the same from your standpoint, right? You have Vince McMahon, you have WWE, everyone with major, major Mm -hmm. backing behind it. But for you jumping into this role, was there some hesitation? And then also as you guys build it out, what are some of the learnings you've taken away to make sure that that's not the XFL, right? The XFL isn't a one hit wonder again. Yeah. I mean, of course, the first phone call, what is this? I have a lot of questions, right? Um, But the more due diligence I did, I realized that the foundation that was being built for this was totally different than anything I had ever seen or heard about before. It was not a plan that was being built on, okay, let's get through one year and see how it goes. Our operating plan is built over multiple years to make sure that it sustains itself. Because you can't just do it one year. You got to do it again and again and again. And that's what we will do. Um, It's also completely different to have such amazing media partners. So all of our games are nationally broadcast on Disney platforms, ABC, ESPN, and then Fox. And to have the backing of not one but two massive media companies is unprecedented. Um, And that was something that I I knew was critical to have success out of the gates, uh, but is even more amplified every day as I see the incredible support that we get locally from Fox and ABC. And you say success out of the gates. What's success out of the gates? What have you challenged your staff with? And then, I mean, what's one year success for Wildcats? You look back on this 
in May when the full, so full season's done and you're like, okay, this, this was successful. We know how we can do this again next year and the year after that and the year after that. Yeah. I mean, look, tickets, tickets, tickets. Yeah. We got to sell tickets. Yeah. We got to get butts in seats. That's the business. Um, so everybody listening, <laughs> I hope you go to expowildcats.com right now because it's super affordable and you can go see a game for like going to the movies. Um, but ultimately for me personally, it's staying true to our brand. So if we steer away from this focus on our fans and focus on the community and building this with a really innovative mindset, uh, we will fail. We, we have to stay true to who we are. And if we fall back into preconceived norms without thinking about what's the best fit for our brand and our market, um, to me, that would be failure. And when it comes to failure, and you know, most people don't want to talk about that, but I'm sure there's probably been a few steps along the last eight months where there was a small failure. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't what you wanted. What's it been like riding this up and down probably of the last eight months, getting this to this point, And now even now ramping it up as you're what, 100 days or so away from like the next or the start of where you guys are, are going to put leather to football. Oh, God, it's so exciting. 100 days. Uh, we're, we are almost at 100 days. I think Halloween is that date. Uh, Look, every entrepreneurial ventures and between this one, LAFC, Relativity Sports, and I had my own uh, sports digital platform back in the day too. Um, So I can only imagine what you're going through is, it's hard, it's hard. And you always have to go in with the mindset that you can't predict it. And it's not gonna be exactly what you signed up for. It's always gonna morph. And you wanna make sure that you can roll with it. We look at ourselves as a speedboat right? We want to swerve all the time. Sometimes we're going to swerve in the right direction, sometimes in the wrong direction. And that's okay. The important part is that you can swerve back. Where are you guys swerving now? Always in the right direction right now. I mean, honestly, I think the last 10 days have been some of the best in my career. Uh, Being able to actually talk about our affordable ticket pricing with this marketplace really solidifies our brand and how we can really share this with everybody. Now the fun part starts of getting people in the doors and making sure that we co-create a great game day experience. And yesterday was probably a bucket list day, maybe the top of my career, to sit in the room with our amazing coaching staff and think about and actually draft the initial phases of 70 guys joining our team. Um, that's, That's something that will never happen again. First, first off the line, first in the, first in the building, and I guess too, for, from your standpoint, as as you go forward now, and, and you're looking at year one, you're looking at year two, and, and three, and four, and five. What do you think the impact of the XFL in LA, from a community standpoint, and potentially more than that, what does that look like? And and I think in your standpoint, that's really obviously a focus. But like, what do you want the the lasting impact? Whether the XFL is around ten years, hundred years, two hundred years, what's that lasting impact for the Wildcats? Uh, I think it's twofold. Um, it's amazing hearing the players' stories. So we've had a bunch of combines and tryouts and opportunities to go face to face with players who are hoping for that second chance. And there really isn't a platform out there for this amazing talent. And I think it's great that the XFL is putting that out there so that <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds of guys who really deserve to play professional football can and have a place to do it. So that will be an amazing transformative component for not just the players, but for kids who are looking for other outlets for football and teams. Um, for me, I think I've, I've been very lucky to be in sports for a long time, but now I have the opportunity to be in a role where I can truly make a difference on the community. So our football has to be great and it has to be at the core of who we are as a league and as a team. And I know that Coach Moss is gonna deliver on that because he's incredible. Um, and he's he started drafting an amazing set of players. Uh, but the truth is I wanna make sure that it's more than that. I want the football product to serve as a springboard for everything else that we can do in this community, whether it's with kids or other components of where the city can use our help. How's the market responded from other sports teams in terms of outreach, in terms of support? What is it like, you know, obviously they do crossover nights. There's a bunch of different things. Has has it been similar for you guys in in the XFL? Yeah, it's so positive. It's so positive. This business is small. It's a small group. We, We all know each other and we need each other, frankly. I mean, we really need to support one another to make sure that we can all succeed in this marketplace and that we can all use sports as a unifying factor for L.A. And when it comes back to that, it is really about LA, right? Why from your standpoint, 
seeing what's gone on? Are you bullish on LA and XFL in the LA in terms of like just overall product and what it can bring as a differentiator to the market beyond just like spring football? Yeah, I mean, th- there was a long process done before I even got to the XFL of what are the right markets for this? Do you follow more of an AAF model and go to smaller markets? Do you go to larger markets? And obviously, I wouldn't be here probably if it was there wasn't a team in LA. So I'm super excited about that. But I think it works. And I think it makes sense. Uh, it is a cluttered market. And there's a lot happening here. Uh, but we're also filling a void. There is a void where people want more football in the spring. And there are a lot, a lot of football fans here who can support this team. And I think where, you know, there are so many divisions and rivalries, this truly is this opportunity for all the fans of all the teams to unite around a team that's being born and raised in L.A. And you talked about it earlier, but uh, your digital media background, you ran your own thing for what three years, right? Yeah. What <laughs> looking back on that now is probably like, man, I didn't even expect I was running my own thing now. But talk about the running of that, your own organization and your own business. Now you're running your own organization too. It's like it comes kind of full circle, right? Yeah, I mean, I was in uh, mid twenties um, doing that with no clue what I was doing. <laughs> so I had an idea, and I was trying to make this idea become something without the experience uh, behind me to make it work. This is different. Now I have more than a decade of experience since behind me where there's a great set of um, unique experiences across very various sectors in this business that have all led to me being able to step into this role and take on all the components of the fan engagement side of the business from ticket sales to partnerships, community, PR, events, you name it. And we've talked about the excitement, broadcasters, fans, early success with the draft, the launch of the brand, everything like that. What do you expect some headwinds to be over the course of the next year, two years as as LA and the Wildcats come to kind of a, a fruition? Yeah, I mean, right now it's really brand awareness. I think we are spot on with what we stand for and our ticket prices and what we're doing on the field. And now it's a matter of telling that story because we have a short runway and everyone in LA, as we all know, is late to the party. (laughs) Almost as bad as Miami. Yeah, exactly, almost as bad as Miami. But we only have a five home game season, so you'll miss it. You have to be there on game one. So our challenge right now is making sure that we get that brand out there, we get people there for our opening day and that they see what we're all about. And from a challenge standpoint, how do you you feel like you guys are gonna I would say like, I wouldn't say swerve around those challenges, but meet them head on, right? With an awareness standpoint, what's, what's the strategy behind the awareness? Is it grassroots? Is it, you know, big over the top out of home? Like what's kind of is your thought process going back to LAFC and how you built out that brand with the team there? What worked and like what didn't work and what is going to work for you guys? Yeah. So I think LAFC did a great job of staying on brand and has continued to do so. And that's where I said earlier, if we stray from what our brand stands for, then we become inauthentic, then it's unclear what we stand for, and then we lose that connection with our fans. So stay on brand, stay true to who we are. If it takes longer, it's it's better to stay on brand and take that risk. The other thing I think from a business side that I think about every day is I wanna always stay current and evaluate what we're doing in every sector. Because like I said, sometimes we're gonna swerve in the wrong direction, but we have to course correct as quickly as possible. So, you know, we, we can't wait until January to reevaluate our marketing strategy, right? We've got to think now, is this working or is that not? And should we try something else so that we're not too late? What's been like the biggest learnings or takeaways from your standpoint so far? Wow, there are a lot. There are definitely a lot. But I think, um, I think it's, it's, it's how quickly we're moving and it's a short runway and making sure actually that all of our staff understand what needs to get done. So time is the most valuable thing that we have and we have to figure out how to spend the time efficiently. What are the key efficiencies to spend the time on? You know, I wish I had more time in every day to actually plan what I was gonna do the next day. Um, So that's something I'm working on, but I think you really need to think about what are your temple events or, or challenges that you have to nail right and focus on those and there'll be time to do other things in year two and year three but focus on those tentpole items because you got to get the core stuff right 
It's almost like the in and out model. That's what I tell our team. It's like, you got to get the burgers and the fries right before you add the milkshake. And then once you add the milkshake, then you're all right. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> now you guys are going to add the milkshake in year two, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I guess too, going forward, it's, it's probably, it's hard to see the vision all the way through, but like, what's it been like to see some of the vision come together over the last eight months? I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's really coming to fruition. It's, it's something that started as an idea over coffee when I, you know, was taking a lot of what I learned from LAFC and bringing it to this product. And, um, and now it's happening. I mean, when we got our name and logo at the end of August and became the Wildcats, that was a massive moment. It was the birth of a team, right? We got the title of our book and now we have to write the story. So when we have our fan meet and greets, the first one we had after the Wildcats, we had a packed, packed place where we came alive and now we have players and now we have founding season ticket deposit holders, right? So every week there's something new that is building upon the framework of the week that came before and uh, we're coming alive and chapter one is starting to be written. It's never a bad thing. I talked to one person who tells me to this day, he still has emails from subscribers when people subscribe because he's like, it's like, oh, okay. Someone else subscribed today. Yes. Probably, probably he's like ticket sales. All right, cool. Someone else put down their d- donation and their deposit. I mean, um, so no, it's really exciting. And I guess too, as you take the next step, both in your career and the longevity of the XFL, what's what's next for you beyond this if anything and like how do you see this playing out for you personally yeah i mean look we've got a lot to do and so i'm super focused on february 2020 and i've only been here i guess you've said eight months yeah um so i i'm truly focused on it but this was a really appealing opportunity not because it was just a new another new team but a new league at the same time and i got to step into a role where i was taking on new challenges And for me, that's exciting. And I'm loving every minute of it. I mean, what I get to do on a day-to-day basis to me is is a dream come true. Truly, truly is. I'm not just saying it. Um, I really, I feel very fortunate and I just wanna continue to build on it. And now that we're building a platform for what our team stands for, we're getting players, we can really now go out into the community and actually make that impact that I was talking about. And what's it been like working with the leadership of the XFL as a whole? Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Um, we've got a great team in Connecticut. Jeffrey Pollock, as I mentioned earlier, and Oliver Locke as CEO and commissioner. They're they're both phenomenal at what they're doing, and they're they're steering us in all the right directions. And from your standpoint, how how does it play out in your mind when you hit the first game? You see the crowds in the stands. What are the what do you think the emotions are going to be like? So I remember this when LAFC had its home opener in April of 2018. And I went and found a moment by myself in it was one of the 200 level sections. And I stepped away from all my peers, all the fans, closed my eyes and listened. And then I opened and got to match that sound with what I was seeing. And it was completely magical completely magical. All that hard work really went into something that was transformative for the city and for a lot of people. So I anticipate doing the same thing uh, in February. And it's really about taking that moment. I One of the things that's on my list to start doing is journaling. I want I want to try to record what these moments are like, because I have a folder where I save those notes, like you said earlier, which I go back to every now and then, but I need to, I need to save the feelings because sports brings out emotions in people that you can't get through many other things. And that's why with all this landscape around sports changing and and the industry changing, the sports themselves are not going anywhere because the idea of a team and a community and winning and losing together just generates something inside that is, is, something you can't replicate you know when you high five a fan who's sitting next to you that you don't even know in a stadium you would never do that in any other context right and it's all about unity and you know i just i I can't wait to see what we can do with that and you have a moment of reflection but you've probably had some moments too where here in the last eight months as you go forward it's been like 
world feels like it's caving in. I know, you know, someone is running a business, you have these opportunities where it's just like, oh my goodness, you know, the fire drill starts. But for you, what is it, what has it been like to even experience those and kind of like grow from that too? I'm sure, I'm assuming there's been a lot of personal and, and professional growth that comes along with even like going through moments like that, that you wouldn't have experienced really anywhere else. Yeah, there's definitely moments where the stress levels are high and the emotions are high, good or bad. And I think being a mom really helps. It totally grounds me. I come home and my kids have an issue, our family has an issue, and it puts everything in perspective. Um, the hardest challenge is finding balance because you, you need to make sure that you keep yourself healthy in order to be your best self at work. So that, that to me is critically important for all my staff, right? Like you gotta have good things going on at home so that when you show up to work and you put those hours in, that you're in a good mindset. Coming into this leadership role, what was it that you took from other bosses, other presidents, other CEOs, other high level people that you worked with that you now are seeing come to fruition from a staff standpoint or how you wanna build your team, right? This dream team, what has that kind of been like? I've had some really good bosses in the past uh, from Tom Penn and Larry Friedman at LAFC um, and Josh Schwartz and Happy Walters at Relativity um, and on and on down the list. I, I've really learned a lot. Um, I think I've had to find my own style a little bit. I've pulled some from all those old bosses, but I'm really about honesty. Same thing that I'm doing with our fans, right? I want to I can't tell my staff everything that's happening, right? And share everything, but I'm gonna share as much as I can and tell you when I can't, right? So that they have as much transparency as that I can give them. And I think that empowers the staff to know that I have their back, that they're not in the dark, and then that I trust them. And I really want my staff to each lead their own respective departments and divisions and teams. And you know, I'll step in when I need to step in, but that I have trust in them and faith in them. And you think it's going to go a long way that way? Yeah. I mean, I look at my staff as people that I want to have in my life as friends for forever. And, you know, it, it's that that's sort of my style on it is we're building friendships and also working relationships. And there's there's lines there, you know, that you have to be careful about. But I think my staff knows that I'm going to be as authentic as possible. And I'm gonna share the good and the bad where I can. And as long as we are a community and a team and we can grow together, we're gonna to get through it all. And I think you mentioned the community aspect too, but just you being visible, right? You said most presidents aren't drinking beers with fans. Most people aren't doing that. Why was it something that you felt like had to be a priority? And, and, and what has that been like to just even get an understanding of what it is that they want on a day-to-day -day basis? It's probably very different than any other role that you've really been in. Yeah, and look, we're we're still a startup organization and we actually selected an office space that's a co-working space. So we work in a co-working environment where we're all in one room at the moment. It'll shift a little bit, but the <laughs> idea is that we started with five people around a table. Yeah. And that was our office. And now we have some, you know, other room rooms you can go into, but the idea is that we're doing this together. And everyone's gonna pick up the slack no matter what your role is for the person next to you. And that's, that's how you build something like this, you know? And that's how you've built everything else. Like that's how all the other organizations were. Scrappy. We're all scrappy. You gotta be, you gotta, you gotta be a team and be scrappy. And that's probably leads itself back to my basketball days in high school. <laughs> Going back, I guess, to your basketball days and just your own personal journey. What's it been like, you know, the career up to this point and you coming from a law background to now running a team, something you ever imagined? Yes, absolutely. And it's because my parents always said that I could do whatever I wanted to do. My first job was when I was 18 years old, I graduated early from high school. And uh, we had a family friend who gave me an internship opportunity at uh, what was called the MCI Center, now Capital One. And I got to work at the venue on the partnership side when Michael Jordan was playing for the Wizards. Tough life. <laughs> it was, I mean, literally, I would like sneak in the back of the venue, you know, to do some intern errand and get the best view, right, of what was happening with the best athlete probably of all time. And I was hooked. I was hooked. And all of a sudden, I, I didn't know anything about the business really at the time, but I got my first taste. And I had to figure out how I was going to break my way in. And it wasn't conventional. 
but um, every step along the way was really just another way of gaining a new set of experiences, networking to gain more and more relationships to figure out what was the next stepping stone where I can continue to build on my past experiences. And do you think some of it's been hard work, luck, mix of both? Mix of both. Definitely hard work though, but, and, and you, gotta, you gotta go hunting a little bit. I, I preach networking. I'm a big networking person. You got to make sure that you have those relationships out there because there aren't a lot of jobs in sports. And when they open up, you want to be front of mind for the, those that have the hiring decisions. Um, so you got to network to always be there. That's how I got my job at the NHL, frankly, was, you know, the NHL was likely going to have a work stoppage. They needed another labor lawyer to come on board and help with the process. And I knew somebody who was in-house counsel there who I was regularly in touch with, Jessica Berman, and she gave me a chance. And now she's at the NLL. Exactly, exactly. And now you guys are running the world. <laughs> I don't know about that, but- <laughs> One day. Um, I'm, tr I'm truly grateful for that, right? And those are people that, you know, who gave, gave me a chance at the right time. And now you're giving the XFL and the Wildcats a chance. We talked about it a little bit. Why at this point in your career did you think it was it was the right time to give this a chance and give this a try and, and, and see what happens? Because you know, for most people, doing something like this is not in the cards. It's scary, right? It's something that it's uncertain, especially with everything else that has happened. But why, from your standpoint, was this the right time, the right group of people, the right location? Why did all the stars align? I like challenge. I like challenge. I like building things. Um, but it was a calculated risk. I went from a team that we had already built one of the most successful expansion franchises in, his, in history and an amazing, amazing stadium venue facility. And it's a little hard not being there this season <laughs> as they win the supporter shield. I won't lie about it. Um, but I thrive in a challenging environment and being able to look back on everything we've accomplished just in the last few months, let alone how I'm going to feel in April when the first season is over, is just, it's, it's too rewarding an opportunity to pass up. And at the end of April, at the end of 2020, what does it look like in your mind where it's like, okay, we've set ourselves up for success. I've set myself up for success. The organization has set itself up for success. What is that like end of the year as you look ahead now at the end of 2019 to 2020? How does it play out? Yeah, I mean, I think I look a few more years in the future. I mean, we really want to continue to build on this year after year. I mean, it's it's like I said earlier, we've, we've got to do things right for year one, and then we got to do it again in year two and year three. But this is going to be a 100-year-old brand. So next year at this time, we're just going to be doing it again, just even better for year two.